if you want my recommendation and you want it something cheap, get like a French press coffee maker because that's what I had. I used to have like a Keurig sort of machine where you get the K cups and you you do all that. But the reason I like French press so much is because, you know, it's it's the same grounds and yeah, you have to clean it out after every time, but it's like you know, as long as you've got boiled water, if your electricity is out, you know, it's, it's easy to find ways to boil water. And, um, and it tastes, it doesn't taste the exact same, but it tastes good enough that, that, you know, that you would be, uh, that you would be content with, uh, with, with drinking it. And that's why, that's why I recommend like French press. Cause it's cheap. It's like, 10 15 bucks as compared to a keurig machine which is like 50 something yeah and the, the keurig also kicks off all that extra plastic and it's yeah. it's like a big it is like a very industrial revolution sounding device it fills the room with grinding and junk <laughs> really i think what i'm trying to do is work my way to enjoying cowboy coffee oh so okay. that would be just serve it black over a fire you see because i'm in my 30s now i've gotten very fancy later in life <laughs> you know i've gotten a lot of I, I have a nice cushy bed my entire 20s living like a hobo living like an ass like a lot of people but now i'm very fancy i like night i fine dining everything slow roasted everything is bespoke and i want to get back to all i need is a fire and several guns like a cowboy you know um my wife has mixed feelings about this, but I think with enough years, I can wear her down. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope, you know, it's funny you say that. I hope I'm not front loading my, uh, fancy enjoying to the beginning of my life because I, I love, uh, you know, I, 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 it might just be because I was born and raised and I grew up around the Imperial capital of the United States. Um, that, affluence kind of was uh the what was it it was the rule of the day for my childhood i mean it was funny it wasn't until i went to college in a rural part of the country in rural virginia that um that i kind of realized that it's not that it's not that uh nova where i i grew up where i was born and raised northern virginia it's not that nova is how do I even say this? The, 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 uh, the, this great beacon of civilization. That's the center of everything, you know, which it is. It's that, um, uh, it's that everywhere else as compared to that. And if you were born and raised in that beacon, that center of civilization in Northern Virginia, and then you go down to somewhere else, even rural Virginia, and you realize, holy shit, where I was, where I am from is the center of everything quite literally like like you know a lot of people don't realize that the internet requires physical infrastructure to continue existing it is not a it is not this ephemeral thing that is just yeah. <clears throat> up in the cloud or whatever they call it no like you need fiber optic cables millions of miles of fiber optic cables you need uh, massive massive data centers which is pretty much all that is in the the place that i am from um massive data centers and it's all just it's all just collections of 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 server farms this conversation we're having right now is probably being routed through routed through one of them not six miles from my house i remember the first time in my life that i learned about the transatlantic cable about and this goes back to telegrams the, the idea that they just laid a giant cable at the bottom of the atlantic ocean I don't know. That just seems crazy to me. Like it blows my mind that that's just sitting down there. And then yet that's how everything kind of works. I remember when I was young, I, I watched this movie called Crumb, just to add on that point, this documentary that really impacted me, maybe more than it should. is about the artist. I brought this up before named Robert Crumb. And the documentary is called Crumb. And he's this artist, American artist, cartoon, did American Splendor, did Fritz the Cat. But he was talking about he would always draw these urban scenes. And he was, he made a point that I always think about, which is he said, there's all this stuff going on in the world that people cancel out of their vision. And he said, no one really draws telephone poles. And he makes a point to draw the telephone poles and all these wires hanging in the air. And people just forget that they're there. And um, I worked in, I work in advertising and I worked in, in billboard advertising for a while. And this became a thing that we had to deal with that 
how much of the real lived reality that you experience every day do you actually just cancel out of your vision and forget that it's there? So that is something I think about not a lot, but from time to time. You know, it's funny. It's funny you say that because, you know, I'm a big literature guy. I very much love literature. And one of the reasons I, I've been on a big Cormac McCarthy kick recently. Oh, that's good. Um, I like reasons, I love that. Yeah. One of the reasons I love his writing style so much is that, you know, you know how you talk about that cancellation of lived reality, i.e. you're walking down the street and there are telephone wires everywhere and all that and you recognize them and you know they're there every time you walk by them but you immediately forget them if you were to imagine that street you wouldn't imagine the telephone wires um you would imagine the cars you would imagine the um the roads you would imagine the buildings and all this other stuff but you wouldn't imagine the telephone wires and that same principle can be applied not just to telephone wires but to damn near everything in any yeah. room in any area um and what Cormac McCarthy does, his writing style is he's kind of he's he doesn't forget that lived reality. He mentions that lived reality um, in ways that tie back into the story, you know, like, you know, he especially in, in No Country for Old Men, like, you know, one of at one point someone checks into a Ramada. Well, I don't really you know, I would think a hotel. I don't really give a, you know, about which shitty middle class hotel this character has checked into but he he makes sure to point that to emphasize that he checked into the ramada here off i 60 or whatever yeah uh in texas and da 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 da, da. but he he it flows seamlessly into the story um and that's why i like his writing style so much because i don't see a lot of that a lot of that sort of at least that same principle used by other writers even thomas pynchon and, um, you know, the freaking Chew who lives up in New York. <laughs> uh, he wrote, he wrote like three good novels. And then uh, he, Gravity's Rainbow. Is yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one everyone talks about, but no one has actually read. Um, I have it on my list to read. And I'm, like, <laughs> I got that. And right now I do the thing every, every white guy who likes to talk a lot does, which is like, I got infinite jest on my shelf and have never opened it. <laughs> I don't, I mean... Actually, the one the one novel he wrote that I actually did like, and it wasn't Gravity's Rainbow, nor was it V or The Crying of Lot 49, which are both good, um, as is Gravity's Rainbow, for that matter. That's actually, you know, that's actually uh, people have been posting a lot of Werner von Braun and like the metaphysics of, of, of rockets in space. That's the book to read if you want to get into that stuff is Gravity's Rainbow. Yeah. Um, but the book he wrote that I really liked was actually Mason and Dixon. Because I thought it was a really unique idea of a uh, character setting, uh, particularly w within like the the 18th century America, and um, and what it's really it's a, it's sort of a post it's it's the postmodern kind of picture of what 18th century America looked like. That's what Mason and Dixon is, and that's not bad per se, right? A lot of the, a lot of people, especially on the dissident right, get confused with what postmodernism, modernism, all this other stuff actually is because they just confuse and conflate the terms. But, you know, postmodernism just really refers to the thinkers after the end of modernism, which is pretty much post-World War II. Modernism begins at about... Sandy has it at the first day of the Battle of the Somme in which 30,000 English men were killed in about eight hours. Um, that was, I think, the beginning of modernism. Um, and modernism ends with, uh, I'm going to tentatively put, uh, 1945. That's about when the period ends. Okay. Um, that massive period you could generally say is the modern period after that. What, what would define that period in your opinion? I, I, I'm not too literate about that stuff. I'm sure most people have heard these words before, but they couldn't describe them. Well, the best way I could define that period is... It's 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 the kind of period. It's the only kind of period that could have created Adlaw Huxley's Brave New World and uh, George Orwell's 1984. Okay, that's basically those. Like I said, those two books tell you more about the period from 1916 to 1945 than they really do about our modern day. And um, and I know that's a that's that may be a contrarian take, but I guess the energy no, I've could... been saying that fucking forever that if, <laughs> in 2022, if you find yourself saying this is just like 1984, I think you're 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 trying to make the present relevant in the wrong way. 
You know what I mean? Literally, like literally 1894. No, but um, but yeah. So if I had to, if I had to categorize the energies that um come about that period, it really is the most dark, bleak, and terrible period I think in the entirety of recorded human history. Certainly recorded Western history. Um, the Thirty Years' War is close. The Black Death is close, but. And those were those were spread amongst a much longer time period and therefore were far less violent in the immediate moment. But the thing about the the world wars were that they were so much violence concentrated in such a short time that most people don't even recognize the the amount of 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 shock, of awe, like of of civilizational wide shock that has not that is even to this day we're just kind of coming out of that daze of these these like this double barreled sacrifice of basically two generations back to back and i guess i guess i guess to actually accurately answer your question modernism is the artistic uh reflection of that it is deep dark gray buildings and evil you know personality list suits and and you know pink floyd's the wall and and manufacturing and uniforming and 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 the destruction of any and all regional culture this is the thing people talk about how you know regional cultures in the modern day are being destroyed there it's the, actually the complete opposite they're talking about problems of the 1930s and 1940s where um regional dialects were more or less exterminated across the world regional cultures were very much um were very much stamped out by mass media by the first introduction of mass media uh, which was far more effective long ago than it is today yeah I, go ahead i was gonna say that's interesting because um speaking of you know the first world war not only i think a lot of people you know correctly look at the second world war as a big you know, civilization defining event but the first world war always stood out to me as more insane and uh, it's like the conflagration of like many things becoming modern. There were, few, and I mean, it's not to say that there's always rules in war, but it seemed like there's more insane things being tried in the First World War. And I see what you're saying, which is I always think of the phenomena of futurism because futurism came out about at this time. And really it was because what modernism is, it's a reaction to not only scale, but speed. You talk about the sum. You talk about these many people killed so fast and the speed of the modern world really driving people insane. And futurism, as both an artistic movement and a political movement, was saying, let's just do that. Let's just do speed and violence. Maybe that, because that's new. This idea of, of I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a plane, I'm in a train, I'm in all this technology. I've never experienced this before. And modernism is just like the becoming insane from that in a sense. And, and maybe that's the wrong take on it, but no, I just, no, that's I exactly, that. no, that's exactly it. That's exactly what classified the, um, uh, the art movement of specifically uh, futurism, which was an outgrowth, an outgrowth of modernism. Um, and you could really look at fascism as the political ideology, fascism, Nazism, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. I know there's a lot of people who get their panties in a twist when I use fascism to refer to both, but you know, that those, both of those movements are kind of the natural outgrowth. They're the political expression of that kind of era. And, um, and the reason why I don't think you can really fucking bring those movements back is because, well, the conditions for those movements aren't really here anymore. You know, everyone, one, one, of, one of the things, if, if there's one thing, if there's one thing that my writing, my work could, you know, I could, I could spread, I could share, I could get people on these side of things to, um, to internalize. It's the fact that, you know, we talk about this totalitarian state, we talk about this tyranny that we live under, right? Actually, today, I think this current time is one of the freest times within the last two centuries, probably, since the beginning of the 19th century. This is probably one of the last two times that you have more freedom personally than you've ever had, right? And what where we ought to be spending our resources, where we ought to be spending our discourses, figuring out exactly how in the real life, in the material world, in practical ways, we can use that freedom. And I can elaborate more on that if you'd like. But yeah, that's yeah, kind go of ahead. one I, take I have. That, that sound, it sounds like this is sort of a focus of yours. I'd like to hear more if, if you got more. Well, yeah, I mean... 
Let me just say before I start, I should introduce you. I'm gonna because I'm not, <laughs> yeah, 15, I'm not gonna make the same mistake. Minutes in, <laughs> yes. So I'm speaking with uh, the very popular, the very very great Paul Fahrenheit. He's a writer. I know him from uh, the Fahrenheit Family Archives. That's available on Substack, and that is uh, P A U L F A R E N H E I D T dot substack dot com paul fahrenheit and you can check that out if you'd like to learn more about what we're talking about today and let me ask you that's what i know you from is there anything else that you are affiliated with that you'd like to be known for uh well yeah you can you can find me on my substack there you can also find me on twitter at cav king paul that's c-a-v-k-i-n-g-p-a-u-l um i've had a bunch of tweets take off recently about honestly really stupid things but you know it is what it is the algorithm giveth and the algorithm taketh away. Um, you can also find me on Telegram. I have a Telegram channel called Hotel Fahrenheit, spelled the same way as it is in my uh, substack. That's F-A-H-R-E-N-H-E-I-D-T. A lot of people, they forget the D because I... Oh, I, I forgot. I, a... I fucked that up the first time too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, a, I was a faggot when I was picking my uh, pseudonym. Um, I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell it the German way. It's a cool name. <laughs> Hotel Fahrenheit is also a cool name. All the guys that you're kind of affiliated with have cool names for things. Like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Clausington? Is that him? I think so. One of them is the IQ Shredding Chat is one. Yep. Like, there's a lot of cool names going around. Yeah, Clausington's a good guy. I've met him in real life. He's he's very pleasant to be around. Um, extremely intelligent uh, engineer. Um, and yeah, like... like w- him and I and, and a bunch of other people, including your previous guest, Christopher Sambach, kind of hang around the same sort of uh, the same sort of spheres. And um, uh, most of the time talk about, you know, talk about stuff like uh, talk about stuff like we're talking about now. But, you know, Sambach and, and other people usually talk about stuff like economics. And I don't really I don't really give a shit. Um, <laughs> mostly mostly because if it doesn't have to i'm you have to keep him it's like so to the, to you and to the listeners i am not a very smart man i am not a very high iq individual i am i am none of these other stuff you won't have me quoting numbers quoting all this other shit right i'm a simple guy i'm a simple guy you know i'm military minded you know those of you familiar with me will know that know my story i'm not going to get into that you can actually if you want to hear about my military experiences you can go listen to episode one of thomas 777's uh podcast mind phaser where i talk about that stuff you know me being present at uh the 82nd airborne division when the fall of kabul happened and all that but um but i'm a simple guy you know and for me for me simplicity itself is figuring out what does god want what does God want from us? You know, what what tools has God given us to get what he wants from us? And to me, that's the only real that's the only real thing that I've ever really given a shit about is what does God want? How are we going to get it? And um, uh, and, you know, how are we going to keep ourselves sane enough to get it, I suppose? Um, and. Yeah, I mean that's kind of that's kind of what most of my writing looks at, you know. I I mean if you read my writing, you know, I've written something in pretty much every genre, short stories, poetry. So a genre I call creative nonfiction or well, not I call, but a lot of people call it creative nonfiction, which is the epi- the was it, the uh, archetypal example of creative nonfiction is Shelby Foote's three-volume history of the Civil War in which he tells the Civil War as if he were writing a novel. He presents the facts, he presents the events, he presents the the feelings, the character flaws, the virtues of each character, and he presents them for pretty much every character involved with the Civil War as if they were a character in a novel. And that's what creative nonfiction is. Creative nonfiction is telling a story that already exists like you would tell a fictional story. And it's actually, it's it's become very, very, very popular in recent years as a as a genre. Because people, especially now, now that we've, um, you know, I was talking earlier about the shock of the 20th century, which was set up with the with the shock of the 19th century. Um, in the 21st century, for the first time, we're starting to get over that, and so people want to figure out, much like a, much like a, what's the what's the what's the word for who's the person on a police staff that um uh, that investigates dead bodies? The coroner. Oh, yeah, coroner. coroner. Yeah. 
Yeah, much like a coroner performing an autopsy, most people want to look back at the last two centuries and be like, what the fuck happened there? How the fuck did we get here? And that's why creative nonfiction has become um, a popular genre. And, you know, if you read my works, specifically my creative nonfiction works, you'll listen to me talk about land all the fucking time. You'll hear me. You, I, I can't stop talking about land. I can't stop talking about bloodline. I can't stop talking about um, God and how all three of those things kind of intersect. And that's that's kind of the whole the whole shtick, the whole thing that I drive towards is it's like, well, those are probably three of the things that determine more than anything else what your purpose in life is and what we're doing here is God, land and bloodline. I like that summary of it. And also on the creative nonfiction front, um, I was reading a book and still I'm in the middle of it. And this might be on the fringes of applicable, but it was um, the history of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth, which it was written in, I think the year 1100. And it's speaking about the previous thousand years. So it's this guy who's say like the founding of Britain. How was it founded? How was it by, by, by Brutus and everything? So he wasn't there, obviously, but he's the way he tells the story is kind of like you say, he tells it in not in fiction. He mentions the names, he mentions the events, but he really, w when he's describing how you know Britain fought off a Roman invasion by Julius Caesar twice. He describes it in a very not fiction like way, but it's it's a narrative fashion where you feel like you're there. And it's oh, yeah. not just a stuffy history book. And he's saying there's no way he could know this, and it probably wasn't written records, but he's got a very detailed speech that puts you right there. Well, and, and he's also talking what? about Something giants, very which is really cool. Yeah, well, and those were real, by the way, just so you know, like that's it's it's almost historical fact that I think. Well, also, because why would he make that? Up? And he's describing them as like, oh, it's these people who are 12 feet tall and we just killed them all because it's like, well, yeah, I mean, sure. Why not? <laughs> well, and, you know, speaking of English writers who who, you know, Shakespeare isn't so much applicable, but. You know, Shakespeare is quite literally the greatest person who ever sat down to write out a thought on a piece of paper that I think ever existed, period. Um, and, you know, Shakespeare did something very similar when writing his histories. You know, he, you know, he is writing plays, sure, but he's presenting those plays. He's presenting these, quote, historical events, unquote, as if it was a narrative, as if it was there. And to him, to him and to everyone else, it was history. It was, you know, Shakespeare... Shakespeare had no concept that what he was writing was fiction. He's merely, he was merely, you know, telling the events, the true events in a dramatic fashion. And this is something a lot of, a lot of uh, listeners may not necessarily understand about the concept of fiction itself, but the concept of fiction itself, at least as we understand it, is actually very new. It's extremely new. Um, the first, you know, the first work you could probably call a, a fictional work, right? Um, and I'm not talking about shit like fairy tales or or stories and all that, because even those weren't necessarily seen as fiction. But the first work that is like an explicit, conscious, um, not reality work is probably uh, Don Quixote. That's the first, you know, they say that's the first novel. Well, yeah. even the word novel means new in French, right? Because it's an entirely new character that did not exist before the novelist sat down and created him out of nothing, usually combining two or three other characters. And a lot of people, you know, you know, novels, novels as a medium are very much a product of what we could call modernity. They did not become popular until the 19th century where they were they were basically the 19th century's equivalent of fucking video games, all right? And and you read all this complaining like, oh, these kids these days, they spend all day with their nose buried in novels, and they never they never go out and do anything. And that may seem trite to us because like, oh, well, they're reading. But you have to understand that a lot of these were kitsch and trash. And most of the ones that were being read are kitsch and trash, right? Um, I, I, I would recommend any of the listeners, whenever they find themselves in a used bookstore, Go over to see if they can find some 19th century books. You can usually find them because they've got really gaudy covers. And I'm not talking about shit like uh, the Goethe republishings that you can find in English. Just just find some random book that looks like it was from the 19th century. Read through a couple of sentences and ask yourself, is this really good writing? Because it's not. It's not. It's trash. <laughs> um, but, you know, regardless, regardless, it exists. 
And so novels as a as an art form, as a medium, are actually very conceptually limited. They're very specialized. They can only ever deal with the made up setting, the made up characters, all this other stuff that the uh, that the writer has come up with. And I'm not I'm not trying to trash the concept of fiction because I am a fiction writer, but uh, but um, creative nonfiction. The thing about it that I find really, really, really interesting is that creative nonfiction is the modern day revival of mythologizing. It is it is it is a means of mythologizing because you know, Shelby Foote, I've mentioned him before, Shelby Foote, you know, said this thing, you know, as much as it can be called nonfiction, implying that there's no such thing that can be called nonfiction, right? Uh, it's it's merely just the reflection of of the writer himself or herself. But, you know, I don't think women write very well um, with with a couple exceptions, of course. Um, there's always uh, edge cases, but we know not to define our takes by edge <laughs> cases. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite writers is actually Willa Cather, who wrote um, Death Comes for the Archbishop and My Antonia, who are which are two of my favorite novels of the American West. She also wrote Oh Pioneers, which I have not read. But, you know, and she was a fucking reactionary, like, you know, dyke who was based. So basically she was a man. Um, and um, and I like her works. They're good works. But like, you know, I don't I don't think I don't think that, you know, this means that <laughs> I don't think this means that women are necessarily Look, good at shit. American but. Psycho was directed by a woman. Now, does that mean that women should be on the Internet? I don't <laughs> think so, Mr. President. <laughs> Well, uh, either e- either way, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, just uh, I, I like this because this is an interesting sort of vein to drill into because we were talking about just before Cormac McCarthy, and I haven't read too much Cormac McCarthy, but what I did read was Blood Meridian, and I thought Blood Meridian is an interesting example. Perhaps and I'm, I'm kind of working through an idea here. And you tell me if this is bullshit because I look at Blood Meridian as com- almost like what you're talking about a creative nonfiction because, of course, it's fictitious. However. Within those pages, it's real people, real places, real tribes. The Comanche existed. The Apache existed. Um, these sorts of people did exist to the point where you can look at a map of Blood Meridian and look at the path that these main characters charted through the American Southwest and all the all the terrible things that occurred. But And I think that even in the mythologizing case, we look at the character of the judge, Judge Holden. Now, who is Judge Holden? Some people have very pinheaded takes on who judge holden <laughs> is uh, supposed to be like oh he's the devil he represents chaos it's like no that's too stupid that's a dumb thing to say what he, i think he represents and maybe this is dumber but i don't think so is what judge holden i think represents is sort of like that 18th 19th century it's kind of like this new modernism like this character of like a huge pale skin he's very scientific He's very knowledgeable. And that's that line he has in the book that anything that exists without my knowledge exists without my consent. So he's a guy who's into cataloging the world and almost causing suffering and glee. So him, he's just not a destructive force. He could be this the, uh, the figure of creeping modernism in the American Southwest, kind of charting a course as if he were a magical entity, but causing all this confusing havoc as he goes and so that is and i think court mccarthy is obviously smart enough to come up with something like that i'm like that is a, a mythologizing of that phenomena as an entity now does that make any sense or am i out to lunch you you have said like six or seven things in that monologue that i could talk about for probably five or six hours <laughs> um the character of judge holden is is he is exactly as you described him and more. Um, I have, I have a, almost the exact same take with one sort of addition. Um, but l- let me let me address the other four or five things yeah. first. I, th- I think like, we're, we're Judge Holden fans because there's something about that character that really sticks with you. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of him. Oh, but no. I recognize. <laughs> I recognize. Uh, I recognize what he is. And so let me say this: It's like it's funny you say that because. John Joel Glanton and the Glanton gang and the um, and the path of the the only I think the only fictitious character in that book is the kid who we kind of follow for the first couple of chapters. And then he kind of he. Yeah, I forgot. These are real guys. I totally forgot that part. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. 
John Joel Glanton, the judge, everyone in the Glanton game, more or less. Although I think, I think, um, like I said, I think Miss, uh, Mr. McCarthy takes creative liberties, but you know, this was, these were real people that did go scalp hunting on the Texas Mexico border in the years immediately before the civil war. Um, and so in many ways, this is a, this is a, this is like right on the line. It's definitely a fiction story, but in many ways it's a fiction. You could call it historical fiction and historical fiction is actually somewhat related. Uh, is historical fiction that uses real personages is somewhat related to creative nonfiction. Um, I see them, I see them as cousin genres more so related to each other than to their respective genres of fiction and nonfiction. Um, but you know, with, with, with the judge, right, you know, the judge specifically, I see him as allegorical for Mephistopheles slash Lucifer. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the story of Faust, Dr. Faust. Um, uh, and there's five or six different versions of it. it in Within literature alone, there's the Christopher Marlowe version in which uh, Faust sells his soul and then goes off. And then at the end, he's damned to hell. And then there's the Goethe version where Faust does the same thing. But in the end, he gets away with it kind of scot-free because God is just kind of like, yeah, Lucifer, by the way, you have no power. So I'm just going to take away your contract with him and save Faust anyway. Um, I like Goethe's version better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but this kind of ties back into, you know, forgive me, the Spenglerism, the Faustian civilization and the Faustian man. Of, of which America... This is a big point of contention, by the way, because I've had a lot of people say, yeah, we talk about the Faustian spirit quite a bit on the show. We covered uh, Spangler, but we also kind of use it as a bit of a bit, like calling everything Faustian. However, <laughs> a lot of people say, um, actually, Faust, uh, they didn't turn out very well for Faust. So, And I, I'm, I'm looking for things to say against that. So this might help a lot. Well, you know what? Those kinds of people, like, and, and I understand why they exist. I understand why they, they, they do the things that they do. But the thing is, is, it's like, you know, contrarianism for contrarianism's sake is is kind of stupid. I mean, what I, the evidence I take that proves the, the truth, the at least, the at least cultural relevance of the concept of Faust and Faustian civilization is just the fact that everyone's talking about Faust and Faustian civilization. Like it's, it's, I don't think it's necessarily broken into normie consciousness yet, but give it a year, give it two years and you will have normies talking about what is Faust and what is Faustian civilization. And, and that's just because, you know, it seems relevant. It seems relevant to the modern day. It seems more relevant than 1984 or some other shit. It's like, well, shit, and and in in order to understand this, and trust me, I'm going to tie this into to the judge and to Lucifer, um, which might actually be a good segue into another topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perf Perfect. But um, uh, but uh, <laughs> but you know, Faustian civilization. What is the story of Faust? Everyone kind of knows it. It's the uh, and even people who don't know to to tie it with Faust. You know, even normies. This is something deep within our folk consciousness. You know, it's the idea of. The devil comes up and gives the man the offer. He's like, hey, give me your soul and I'll give you control over the material world. And Faust is the man who kind of like, OK, I'll take you up on that. Right. In earlier in earlier iterations in earlier civilizations, there were similar stories, but the man never does it. The man never gives his soul. Right. But Western civilization, this makes us different from other civilizations, seems obsessed with what happens once we do give up our soul. Right. And so and so that's what Faust does. Faust gives up the soul and then he gets magical powers. He can make wealth appear out of nothing. He can transmute fucking iron into gold and all this other stuff. And he can summon up the spirits of dead people and go on massive wars and campaigns and generally and, and seduce any woman he wants. And da, 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 da. But then, you know, and then at the end of it, you know, number one, it doesn't make him happy. Number one, it doesn't doesn't fulfill that deep abyss within him of, of, of wanting something of wanting meaning purpose, whatever the heck you want to call it. It doesn't fulfill that. Um, and number two, it, it, it results in, let's say at some point he has to pay the price for his contract, you know, in the Christopher Marlowe version, he is forever damned to hell as the price. Uh, in the Goethe version, he is about to be damned to hell, but then, um, uh, but then the spirit of the eternal divine feminine, comes and displays grace on him and that's some fucking catholic bullshit but um 
But regardless, you know, you could take the wider point of the Goethe version is that Lucifer really has no power at the end of the day. Lucifer is not so much the enemy of God. He is a tool of God. He's more of a what's the right way of saying he's a custodial service more than he is an antagonist. Right. And this is just he's just the way of cleaning stuff up. So, you know, it doesn't matter if Lucifer does make you sign on the dotted line, you know, God can still just snap his fingers basically. And that's null and void. And, you know, the thing about the thing about judge Holden back to the context of blood Meridian, right? I see him as Mephistopheles because keep in mind, it's never Faust himself who gets all of these powers. Like he can use them somewhat, but it's always Mephistopheles, his companion, who he basically tells to do stuff, right? And Mephistopheles has mastery over the material world. He speaks all these languages. He can make all of this stuff appear from nowhere. And you look at the judge, right? How does the, you know, what was it? Um, the kid is talking to the ex-priest, whose name I forget, who's a member of the Glanton gang. And the ex-priest is talking about how they first met the judge in the book. And he says, you know, they were, they were out of ammunition. They were being chased by Comanches or something like that. And they came over this valley and there was just the judge sitting there on a rock um, as if he had dragged the rock there with, because there were no other rocks in this valley. It was just one rock in the middle of the valley that he was sitting on as if he was born from it. He's summoned from it. He dragged it there. And this is Cormac McCarthy playing on heavy mythological implications because Lucifer Mephistopheles demons have always traditionally been associated with the earth, with minerals, with all this other stuff. So the judge is quite literally in the context of the story born from the rock. Please and let ahead. me just say for the context of people who don't know, who have read this before there's memes floating around that kind of talk about this but the judge and correct me if i'm wrong is always almost described as an otherworldly being in the sense that he's very very pale almost chalk white and i believe he's described to be around like seven feet tall oh so, yeah so he's this huge pale bald and is described as having like a, a babyish face so he's all he's kind of creepy, but he's big, but he's also kind of nice and he's not like threatening and snarling. He's the exact opposite. He is cultured. He's seen the world. He seems to have knowledge of how to do everything. So but I'm cutting you off because that's no, no, no. That's, that's that's exactly the point I was driving into. You know, he doesn't have a single hair on his body. Um, he uh, and and, you know, he just he, he always seems to appear out of nowhere right and it's like and it's like um uh, they they appear and they see him just in the middle of the valley and they come up and all, all of a sudden oh w what does the judge know how to do oh hey i can make gunpowder out of nothing i also know where to find the sulfur for it um and so they follow him up and they all and and the judge makes them gunpowder and then first of all, um, let me also describe leads them up a volcano which is like a really really cool scene if i remember like he leads them up and they're describing like ascending up this like blackened, covered in soot, and he's sitting down, and he like almost like conjures it. Sorry to cut you off there. Oh no, you're completely fine. And yeah, and it's and it's like and it's like you know every time they meet a Spaniard or a or what they call a Dutchman, who's a, which is really a German or anything else like that, the judge seems to speak the language. He speaks like six, seven, eight languages. Um, and he can cajole people. He could, he, he will, you know, they get into confrontations with the law in one, I forget what Mexican city it was, but he goes up and he says, yes, yes. Hello, senor, sergeant, whatever. Yeah. And he's very deferential, very much, uh, flatters him, you know, plays on his, e and completely diffuses the situation. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the other thing too, is it's like, is it's like the judge has this, this, this very strange otherworldly charm. Um, and another thing that sticks out is that the ex priest, like the kids, like, you know, I, I met the judge when I was in East Texas and he did this, this, and this. And then the ex priest laughs and he's like, yeah, everyone has a story of how they've met the judge at least once before he joined the gang. So everyone, everyone in the Glanton gang has met the judge once or seen him before he just appeared out of nowhere. Um, in addition, right, in addition, when after this, this whole thing uh, is resolved, you know, Glanton, he's really, he's really sick. Um, and the judge is nursing to him and all that. And, and, and um, they're both riding ahead of the whole company and, and chatting and no one knows what they talked about. But at the end of it, the judge seemed really pleased with himself. Um, 
And so, and so this is all like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Glanton was Faust selling his soul to Mephistopheles, uh, the judge. And it's really the judge running the whole gang, right? That's, that's one, that's one of the various ways you could interpret it. But like, to go back to your earlier point, you talk about the judge as advancing American civilization. Well, what is Faustian civilization, but the civilization that results from selling your soul to Mephistopheles and gaining material mastery over the world. That is the entirety of Western civilization, right? And that's the, that's the, that's the strange contradiction of it is that, is that, you know, we, you look at our factories, you look at our means of extracting resources, and we just know how to do things better than everyone else. Like, like you put four or five white Westerners in charge of a company, that company is immediately successful. You, you do all, it's, it's, it's the, it's the silver bullet. And there's something strange about that. Go ahead. I, I think that's correct because if you look at all of the other, there's a lot of scenes in the book with the judge, and and those are pretty memorable. The entire book is memorable, and you won't find a book that describes terrain in such detail, but it's still like really cool. The way it makes the American Southwest sound is is very uh, in enrapturing. But if you look at these scenes of the judge, I think it lines up with that too because. There's two scenes I remember. There's one where, and I forget the context of the scene, but I think it was what, how one of the people met him. He's like in a church and then there's like a, a, a service going on. He's standing at the back and, and just makes a lie. It was, up a, about it was the, a tent. It was he, a, uh, it, this, this is a, it was like a Baptist revival. It wasn't yeah. even like a church building. And he just basically says that that priest is a pedophile or a rapist. And everyone's like, what? And they just, and they turn against him. And for no reason, he's just happy to do it. And then also there's this scene that I think about from time to time. And I think it, it ties into both of these interpretations, which is they're in some town, they stop in some town and he buys a bunch of puppies from a boy and pays oh, a lot yeah. of money for it and then just immediately takes them and just throws them each into like the river the river and the kids watching it and then and then he's just like smiling and, and thinks it's like the funniest thing in the world so you're thinking like yes he, they were his that's kind of like a comment on property in a sense but that is why not it's my property i can do whatever i want so i think there's all these like little comments that like that feed into these interpretations and then later on he's just naked i guess but that just might be because it's like yeah he's whatever he's weird you know (laughs) well and and that's that's the thing though is it's like you know he yeah he seems to just be perpetrating this like needless cruelty for no reason and you know that's that's what lucifer is in many ways he is um people call him an agent of chaos and he is an agent of ordered chaos, I suppose is the right way. Like he, he is, as a matter of fact, the fact that he is so educated, the fact that he is so aware of, of the material world, what that actually does is that gives you a higher capacity for chaos. You know, for example, I was in cybersecurity for a little while. And uh, for any of the listeners who are in cybersecurity, you would understand that in order to get, sci- get into cybersecurity, you need to achieve your security plus certificate. Um, and what Security Plus does is it basically it teaches you all of the possible ways that websites could be hacked, that people could set up phishing attacks, that people could set up anything, any what what anything whatsoever to sort of prompt a uh, the user to take an action or to do something right in order to share information or to cause a breach. Right. You know, for example. Target's cashier system was hacked by some people a couple of years ago who managed to get into the whole system using HVAC credentials, really? <laughs> using the credentials of an HVAC contractor. Yeah. So there's all sorts of ways you can get into it. And I guarantee you these people were educated in cybersecurity. So what what being educated in an area does is it actually gives you a greater capacity for damage because you then more thoroughly know the system and more thoroughly know how to exploit the weaknesses of said system. System. This is why like professions like ethical hacking, security testing, all that, there's a whole contracting field. I forget what it's called in real life, but it's like people who who are paid, who are hired in order to breach security at banks at other stuff like that and to write reports on that. And so, no, I like that because, you know, when you talk about perhaps being an agent of chaos and controlled chaos, because I think when people say chaos is just shorthand for they don't know what's going on. They just know they don't like it. Like for example, judge Holden, we've got a pretty good 
encapsulation and even people disagree but i don't think you can because we are correct you know the idea that you know once you understand it it's not really chaotic and there's that line what's normal for the spider is chaos for the fly so to the average person you know the the hacking attempt would seem disordered it seemed chaotic but of course the more you know about how things operate it doesn't seem like chaos at all it just seems like a carefully laid plan oh exactly and you know, and and speaking of carefully laid plans in Lucifer, right? Like, like this is this is still how things work in the real world, not just in um, uh, not just in Cormac McCarthy or in even American civilization. The reason, real quick, to kind of put a bow on this sort of topic before we move into the next thing, you know, the reason I am so obsessed with America and Americana—that's kind of my one big shtick. If no one else has gotten that, is America and Americana. The reason I'm so obsessed with it is because. I see America as the final conclusion of Western civilization. I see America as the 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 logical endpoint, as um uh, as the best aspects of all of Western civilization just simply combined into one country. And people will will sit there and be like, oh well, that's just playing into America's own mythology. And I'm like, well, that that's because it's a correct mythology, and that's because. You know, America was founded by an Anglo stock. I myself come from an Anglo stock, but you know, it's it's it, there's others. There have been others here the whole time. And America, America is it's Faustian civilization incarnate. Incarnate. It is it is it is, you know, you can't name a single person from a single aspect of a European country that hasn't come here and done something. And this isn't this isn't fucking nation of immigrants bullshit. Trust me, I'm not saying that, but it's like it's like there is a certain reality that you have to admit that, you know, America, America is the coalition of the West, of specifically the West. Anyone who's from outside the West didn't really do shit for this country. Um, and and America, most importantly, to kind of give a rhetorical flourish to cap this thing off, America is the future. America is where this battle that we see going on between, you know, God and and Lucifer, between all this other stuff, it is where it will be fought, it is where it will be decided. America is, I'm quite literally convinced, the most metaphysically important place on earth, at least at this current juncture. I agree with that. And, and um, we talked to Sandbatch. He, of course, agrees. I've been, I've been dragged into a lot of appreciation of Americana on our show. Like I think last year we covered uh, two books. We covered Albion seed, which covers uh, the Very European immigration and also American nations, which I, I tend to, I like Albion C because it gives a very uh, good outline of what defines a people and what defines a folk way. Cause some people don't know. And there's like 25 different things. So it actually scientifically lays down. Here's what constitutes a folk or a people. But I liked uh, American nations because it takes a bit of a larger scope and factors in not just the, the British and Irish, but also um, the French and a bit more about the natives and a bit more about um, uh, the New Netherlands and the East Coast and the West Coast. So I'm like, that's, that paints a holistic picture because you can't, it's hard to tell the holistic story of America without, you know, the financial centers and what was going on. And also, hmm. Yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm just, I, I don't want to go off too much on just talking about uh, America like that. But I, I do agree with what you're saying. And it does get more interesting the further you go back. And that's the one thing I've noticed where a lot of people's conception of American history, they vaguely know the Civil War. And it doesn't really start until like the, they get, they know the Wild West, but they don't know where that is. They don't know if that's like pre or yeah. post Civil War. It's just kind of a, a mush. But there's like entire, decade long wars that go on in America that nobody talks about. And there's a lot that's going on there that I just find fascinating. Well, I, I, I want to, I, I don't want to go into either the civil war or the wild West, because like I said, those are, those are two fucking rabbit holes I could talk about for, for four years. But yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at the world, right, you look at the concentrations of wealth, you know, you're talking about financial centers, you look at the concentrations of wealth, where are all the concentrations of wealth centered on? It's not England. And no matter what people will say, yeah, some of the biggest companies in the world it was I forget what the biggest insurance company in the world is called headquartered in England, right? But England, but that's all like that's all inertial. That's all like uh, holdovers from sort of the previous age, right? All of the wealth in the world is entirely concentrated in America. 
and not just in New York City. You know, I've talked about imperial core theory and how America really has eight capitals, and I'm writing an article about that right now. Um, but could you briefly just list those eight? I, I'm going to recommend people read that article, but just to wrap my head around it, is there? Of course, America. America is such a big place that, in reality, pretty much our regions are entire countries in and of themselves. America is about seven or eight different countries, just kind of still functioning together out of inertia. But our eight capitals are. I'm just going to go down the East Coast to the West Coast. Boston is the education capital. New York City is the financial capital. Washington, D.C. is the military, internet, and industrial capital. Not industrial. No, 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 no. Military, internet, and military slash intelligence capital or the administrative capital. Um, Miami is the black market and illicit activities as well as the cryptocurrency capital. Um, New not New Orleans, uh, Houston. Houston is the energy capital, not just the oil capital, the energy capital in general. More pipelines, more um, uh, more natural gas facility, all of, all of this energy, whether it's produced by uh, oil, natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar, flows through Houston than any other city in the United States. Um, Chicago is the agricultural, industrial, commodities capital, basically. If you can touch it, if you can conceptualize it, if you can, if you can pick it up and put it down, it was traded in Chicago about five or six times, um, if that few. Um, going out west, San Francisco is the Eight. technology capital. Okay. Technology. Yeah, San Francisco is the technology capital. Uh, it is the it is the center of Silicon Valley of of all this other stuff, and. It's also the largest uh, port of entry into the United States, um, at least as this current moment. And Los Angeles is the media capital. Um, mass media is still centered around Los Angeles. So I think that's eight. Um, let me just count. Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Miami, Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Yeah, that's eight. So those are the eight capitals of the United States, All right. And, and the wealth is kind of concentrated around those eight areas, right? These are the, the cores of the core, the imperial core regions. And everywhere else, you know, everywhere else is more or less just a part of the periphery, just as much as somewhere like, let's say, fucking West Slavonia is, is a fucking part of the imperial periphery. You know, at, so is like, is like uh, Matacumbi, Kansas or something like that is a part of the part of the periphery. You know, it's just as much middle America is just as much a part of the proles as anywhere else in the empire. I was about to say that it seems interesting that all most of these cities, and I'm just conceptualizing this in my head, seem to encircle America on the edges where the entire middle, maybe not Boston, but the, the, I guess that's kind of getting in the middle, but the entire middle is kind of just the periphery in that sense, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so so the thing is, is like this, this, this wealth is concentrated amongst... Um, people groups within these core regions and the periphery, the people in middle America, you know, aren't really a part of the club. You know, this is, this is why actually I think a healthy revival of some early two thousands memes around Bush and all this other stuff, because that's when a lot of this stuff was first started being touched on. Um, a lot of the picture was first started to get revealed and then it got covered up by another part of the picture needing to get revealed. All right. And actually, what what I think the alt right and and other movements have done that were extremely effective and that were necessary was bringing back the importance of race and um uh, and religion, because it, that was what was required to kind of bring them back. Now we understand that race and religion are also important things to look at objectively. And now we need to go back to the early two thousands to figure out, okay, well, you know, who was trying to cover that up? So, you know, these eight capitals. These, there's actually, there's a really good book called The Yankee and Cowboy War. It's out of print, but you can find it on the internet archive. Um, the Yankee and Cowboy War is basically about how at the end of the wasp ascendancy and the wasps, uh, specifically speaking about this, this mid-Atlantic group of people that kind of evolved out of the Boston Brahmins and the first families of New York City and all this other stuff. The people who benefited the most from the destruction of the South and the Southern aristocracy during the Civil War use that inertia, that momentum, to basically make themselves the unquestioned ruling class of the United States 
uh, from say post reconstruction to to the election of JFK. There's a good book on that called Wasps: The Splendors and Misery of an American Aristocracy. Um, and what this what this basically is, and I, I actually I read these two books side by side, Wasps and the Yankee and Cowboy War, because the Yankee and Cowboy War tells you what was happening at the death knells of the wasp ascendancy. And the key family to it is the Bush family. The Bush family are an old, old New England family. Like, like you can find Bushes in New England as early as the 1600s. And, you know, everyone talks about Prescott Bush and bankrolling these people or these other people, right? But what happened at the end of the, the wasp aristocracy is that the Bushes kind of realized where the wind was blowing. And so they kind of picked up and moved shop from New England down to Texas, where the oil industry was just starting to reach its first boom. And by virtue of having this massive financial uh, backing, this, 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 um, this, this generational wealth, they were able to almost overnight just take control of the entire Texas oil industry. And now the Bushes still very much are the first family of Texas. Um, and yeah, you know, they're, they are dying out, sure, but like, like this, is, this is the terms you need to be thinking in. Right. And so it's not just the Bushes in charge of oil. You know, there there is a whole coterie of families. There's a whole coterie of families, you know, that have this stranglehold of the world's wealth, of the world's resources, of all this other stuff. And they it really is a big club that you are not in. And you know if you're not in it. It's interesting you say that because I do recall, you know, around the 2000s, there was more talk of dynasties. And you still hear dynasties brought up a lot. But I don't think, I think when people think of the Bush dynasty, they stop at, you know, George H.W. Bush. By dynasty, they mean, oh, someone was in charge and then their kid was in charge and the Clinton over the trying to start a dynasty. But I, like you said, they stopped talking about that. And I think people misunderstood what people meant by dynasty, you know, in the true sense of how deep these roots go. And you're correct. We did stop talking about that. Or we thought it was just a, a frivolous power game. A couple people were playing. Well, you know. What's 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 absolutely insane to me, and I think one thing that historians will be like, how could these people not like living in this current era? How could they just not fucking see this? How many elections, presidential elections from 2020 back to, say, 92? Why were in every one of those elections? Except for, let's say, I think except for two. um I forget what years those are, but like for from from 1992 to um, uh, 2020, in every single election, that's what 92, 96, 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, and 2020. So that's eight elections over the past eight presidential elections. There has been at least one representative from two families. One representative from two families have contested these elections. I don't understand how that's how how that can be invisible. And those two families are Bush and Clinton, which are two dynasties. And I'm not trying to get into normie shit lib politics, right? It's more of just the, the the patterns you see here, right? This era will be known as the Bush Clinton ascendancy or something like that, right? In which in which these two families more or less monopolized American politics. Um, Let me ask you this: Where does the the Kennedys fall in that, in your opinion? So the Kennedys, the Kennedys are a family of Irish gangsters that got really successful off of uh, running booze during Prohibition and then managed to kind of backdoor their way into the wasp aristocracy on the tail end of it. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't know how much they're how well they're doing now, but at least at least back in the 60s, they were one of the most powerful families in the world. You know, not just talking about uh, JFK, but his brother, you know, his father, um, his father was the real fucking Machiavellian genius, Do Joe Kennedy. Um, and um, and and. And I'm, I'm trying to find I'm trying to find the right way to kind of the right moment to say this, but it's like I, I guess there's no right time to say this other than just kind of coming out and say it. The reason these families, the reason that like your family, let's say, you know, the, the Smiths or the Joe or, or the or the Millers or whatever 
Um, the reason that y'all's family, even though families are one of the most important political units and have the most capacity for power of any political unit, um, the reason your families aren't having the success, the generational wealth that they do is because their families as basically the family business, um, make packs with certain, with certain, um, with, let's just say a certain figure right? That gives them this material mastery over the world, right? And this is kind of, this is why I think the Faust and Faustian civilization is a bit literal. Now, you know, to the listeners, they already know what I'm about to start talking about. So I don't want the listeners to think I'm going off the rails or going insane here. Um, but in essence, like Lucifer as an individual, I'm going to go out and name him. Lucifer as an individual is not a concept. He is not a concept. He is not an abstraction. He is not this fake thing that was come up with. He is a real entity. He is a being just like you, just like myself, just like whatever individual listeners currently listening it. You could go up to him and have a conversation with him. I'm not kidding. Like you could speak to him like you could speak to your mother or your boss or your wife, right? Like he, he, he is real. He exists. And he is on this earth right now in one or another guise. And some of you might have even had conversations with him without even realizing it. And, you know, if we, if you accept that as true, if you accept that as true, well, he comes offering what he has traditionally been portrayed as offering for the entirety of Christian civilization, or at least the concept of Lucifer existing, because the idea of a character called the Morning Star transcends more than just the Christian religion. Um, I was about to say, because even pre-Christian, there would be, you know, talk of the, this sort of figure as well. Yes. Yes. And, and he comes offering what, uh, what he has always offered, which is, you know, you give me your soul, you give me all this other stuff and I will give you material mastery over the world. And this is why I emphasize families so much, you know, and, you know, there's an article I wrote on this called the enemy and his host in which I kind of outline, I outline how Lucifer currently has his sort of clutches on the world. Um, and yes, and that was the the article that got me to contact you. And if you wanted to, we could also list those families to help people out to have them wrap their heads around this. Because that what I like about you and these articles is just like with the power centers in America, which I don't think a lot of people would debate. You know, this you almost mm-hmm. take like a fractal view of this. It's like, would people debate that these are the power centers in America? No. Okay, is it debatable that within these power centers you could have individuals or groups that can centralize power? Does that sound crazy? No. Is it possible that these are actual families that do it, which is how everything is usually done? It's like, no, it's like, okay, you can talk people into getting this because they're immediately apprehensive to like, oh, these are just the individuals. It's like, well, why not? You know, maybe there's more in in the world, but here's here's some big ones. So sorry to cut you off. You can continue. No, no, no. And 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 here's the thing, right? Like, I just want to say this: a lot of people, especially on the dissident right, they kind of they kind of um, they get their they get so they're usually correct, but they're they too often they speak abstractly. Like we talk a lot about elite theory and all this other stuff and the elites. And, um, uh, and all this other stuff, these abstract notions. And it's like, okay, yeah, let's accept that. In theory, yes, elites always rule everything. But then whenever I start naming the elites or whenever someone else starts naming them, they're like, okay, well, you're talking about elites. Well, who are the elites? Oh, they're this shadowy cabal that we don't know. No, they're, they're known. As a matter of fact, they actually tell us exactly who they are and what they're doing um, in explicit detail. And you know, the elites, the elites are real people with names, with addresses. Um, uh, I do not condone um, with anything else. And uh, and, you know, yeah, you said you name the families that I put in this um, uh, that I put in this article. Well, and this is this is this may be an older list. This may be a much older list than currently exists. But, you know, at the time of the gentleman who I was mostly pulling from, who goes by the pen name Fritz Springmeier, his real name is Victor E. Schoof. Um, he points out these 13 families, the families of Astor, Bundy, Collins, DuPont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lee, that's L I Onassis, Reynolds, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Russell, and Van Dune. Right now, all of these families are really old, sort of, they almost all directly come from this wasp aristocracy that I was talking about earlier. Um, 
the Astors, specifically John Jacob Astor, as the as the what the richest man in American history, um, still have a large amount of power. The Bundys, of which Ted Bundy has a distant relation, but really they're uh, they're an old New England family. Um, that might actually explains how Ted Bundy as an individual was just such an exceptional individual. Like that's, you know, he, he, he was quite literally a genius for serial killer. Yeah. And that um, has then Ted Bundy. It's like, it turns out he's a serial killer. That's like everyone likes too. <laughs> what oh, an well, exactly. Thing. Exactly. He's because he, I, I'm not going to get into that, but you know, the Collins family, uh, which are, which are an Irish family, but, um, uh, but they have uh, their their power is much more subtle. The Duponts, which everyone should know about, because my favorite NASCAR driver Jeff Gordon, um, or well, my second favorite NASCAR driver Jeff Gordon. My favorite is uh, is Bill Elliott, uh, awesome Bill from Dawsonville. But I'm uh, but Jeff Gordon drove for Dupont Chemical Company, and the Duponts are they're one of the oldest American aristocracy. You want to talk about American dynasties. They have had a stranglehold on the state of Delaware since more or less it was founded. Um, the Freeman family, the Kennedy family, the Lee L I family, um, the Onassis family. And keep in mind for the Onassis family, what was Jackie Kennedy's maiden name, right? Onassis. She came from that family. Um, that, that's why I was going to bring up. Cause I'm like, I re- I recognize that name, but it's only from her. Well, yeah, and that's what, and they're, they're, and a lot of the, he, keep in mind, like these families, some of them are public facing, some of them are well known for X reason or Y reason, and some of them are lesser well known. Some of them are 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 more behind the scenes figures. You know, the Reynolds family, uh, the Rockefeller family. The Rockefellers is one everyone is familiar with, right? And you know, they're the most blatant and brazen in talking about this sort of stuff because, in many ways, the Rockefellers are kind of. They're kind of the most provincial of this whole list. They came from, I think, Ohio. They were a bunch of bunch of uh, people in Ohio who uh, I think made a deal. Um, the Rothschilds, which is the one everyone points to, everyone knows, like, oh, it's the Rothschild family. And yeah, yeah, they they are among the more the most powerful. They they have in many ways they have a stranglehold on the world banking system. The Russell family, which is a very famous family that myself and Sandbatch have actually talked about quite a bit, how widespread the uh, influence of the Russell family is and the, uh, the Van Dunes. Um, and just for so people know, uh, like you had mentioned, a lot of people look at the uh, Rothschild family. I call them Rothschild. That's probably wrong. It should be Rothschild. Cause like it's, yeah, it's supposed to be Red, Red Shield. Shield. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause a lot of people correctly, identify them but this was the debate that i would get into with people where i'm like i agree that the rothschilds are the the big deal but you you can't believe that to the detriment of noticing that someone like for example bill gates is buying up half the farmland you know so you get to the point where unless there's a rothschild at the center of the conspiracy people don't pay attention and i think we do that at our peril sorry to continue well, well, well who's who's bankrolling bill gates to buy up all this farmland and and can i can i uh can i break euphemisms am i is this going up on odyssey or oh yeah yeah this is going up on odyssey. we've been kicked off of youtube okay so i'm a, i'm going to i'm going to break euphemisms then um the reason that you know i i don't like hitler so much is cuz he went after the wrong jews um <laughs> you know believe believe it or not jews like the uh like the elites aren't really a monolith right this is another problem people get into an elite theory is like oh the elites they're all working together and they no as a matter of fact these 13 families they don't even work together all the time they get into conflicts all the fucking time you know they 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 have different factions they have different clans, different alliances that are constantly breaking down and reforming and all this other stuff, right? You know, it's the exact same thing as your Crusader Kings 2 game, all right? That's that's how politics works. Reality is, is you know, family do- wants one thing, other family doesn't want one thing. That's kind of just how it goes, right? But, you know, Hitler let the fucking Baron Rothschild escape, but he goes after Mr. Dreyfus in charge of a bagel shop. Right. You know, it's like it's like, okay, thanks, Hitler. You didn't really do anything. You kind of you kind of let us know. But you you like the gun wasn't the wrong gun, but it was it was the right gun, but it was pointed at the wrong people, if that makes sense. You know, and and that's the other thing. That's that's another thing that the, the dissident right does. The dissident right actually, in terms of their techniques and their understanding of the world, is usually more or less spot on. The problem is, is that they blame the wrong people 
or they go after the wrong people. Like this is a point BAP makes. And like BAP is a Romanian Jew who works for an Israeli think tank. Oh, well, but BAP, <laughs> but BAP has also publicly gone out as saying the U.S. government is going to try to genocide white people. OK, outstanding, you know, enemy or not, whatever the heck he's not. He's saying shit that is true. I am an unavowed white supremacist. Um, but, uh, <laughs> that's the thing I can't, I, every time I hear about Bab, I'm like, some of the stuff he says, I'm like, I don't get it, but then he does cool things. I'm like, I don't, he's just, uh, an, in, an enigmatic figure. I, I, enigmatic I'm going to sit down and read that book and cover it on the show at some point. <laughs> I'm gonna, I've been memed into reading a lot of books. I'm, I'm going to get me myself into that. Oh man. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> But um, what was what was my point? What was I talking about? About um, Bap, um, Taylor had the you, wrong. You, yeah, 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 I was talking. I was about to talk about Jews. Yeah, so Anons, fellas, it's not the Jews. It's not not the Jews, but it's not the Jews, right? Because the Jews don't exist. Because fucking every Ashki I've ever met hates the fucking Sephards, and every every fucking reformed is like, well, what is Judy? And I, I just, they don't even, it's, it's too easy. It's too simple. Right. You know, and it's not that simplicity is, is bad, but it's more of like, it can't just be them. It can't be them. They're, they're probably accomplices. That's probably, that's my opinion on the, I think that's the right word to describe. That, 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 that seems they're, to be in, in historically where they have fit in. And, and we covered, um, uh, the history of Ukraine a while ago, we read a book all about from the founding of Ukraine, you know, the fall of Rome and, and the original peoples. And there was all these rebellions of uh, what were then not known as Ukrainians. That's kind of a modern invention, frankly. But the types of people who were there were rising up. And then there was this one of the rebellions against the Polish. They were it's remembered in Judaism as this like another genocide. But what was happening was the Polish, like in many cases throughout Europe, were employing the Jews as middle men as as money changers as just this sort of a, a, a free floating bureaucratic force that seems to find its way in a lot of successful kingdoms and then once there's a rebellion of course they go after the middle management and they're like oh my god why is this happening to us but that, <laughs> it, it's a very common story they, they seem to be in kind of wedge themselves in the middle there where they have power as sort of janissaries but never like the guy at the top. Sorry, oh, that's just my no, no. That's that's a great way to kind of describe their place in history. And it's like, yeah, sure, right. We're gonna have, we'll have the doctors' trials. We'll have the fucking um uh, the the second string trials of all the of all the lower guys. But it's like, it's like, it's not them. It's not them. It's not like you can go into your into your like char your local Charles Schwab office and like. And like uh, blame it on the, the manager of that branch of Charles Schwab fucking investing, whatever the fuck, because he's just a, in many ways, he's just a salaried payroll guy who just kind of does what he's told. And that's not that doesn't um, that doesn't take responsibility away from him. That doesn't mean he's not responsible, but it's more of just like, well, you're not really you're not really getting the big fish here. And the thing is, the thing is with it is that it's like they're also kind of used as a shield. Whenever people kind of get mad at whatever's going on in this one place or this other place, you know, the, the powers that shouldn't be can kind of just point at this coterie of people, uh, the Jews, and just be like, yeah, it's all their fault, you know, and, and, and oftentimes they're, they're giving arms to the angry peasants to, to commit the pogrom, right? And it's like, and it's like, what's the right way of saying it? It's like, this is the equivalent of if a guy is robbing your house with a shotgun, grabbing his shotgun with a, and taking a hammer and smashing his shotgun. That's the equivalent, you know? Exactly. And, and, and I always tell people like, again, I'm sorry if we're talking too much about Jews people, but I, I think it's it's relevant when you talk about this stuff, which is to say, because some people will hear this and say, oh, they are in the pocket of Israel. I'm like, no, I'm not saying they're not involved and connected. And, and I always tell people, I'm like, once you understand what Jews are and how they think, once you understand how all of this works, you see how things fit together. So, for example, Jews, all of their actions can kind of be boiled down to a few characteristics. One, they're extremely ethnocentric. B, number one, one, B, Q. Uh, number two, which is that um, they think the entire world wants to kill them for no reason. 
And three is that they kind of think they're better than everyone. That's the th- those are the three things that informs pretty much everything they do. And so they they almost don't want to run the world because they think they already do. It's a weird thing like that. And so if you have a group of people who think they're God's chosen and that's good enough for them, you can kind of fit them in the middle and they it, let them think they're smarter than everyone. But also it, it once they figure out like the world hates us for no reason, you know, that's what they think. You know, that it, it explains pretty much everything they do geopolitically, in my opinion. And once I do that, I'm like, oh, I get you. I, I can kind of predict what you're going to do in every situation. You're also kind of cowardly. You're a cowardly people. And you like engineering situations where you feel like you're not under threat. So I'm like, I get you. But that knowing that about them does not answer for these other massive geopolitical phenomena. And that's, I think, where we're getting at, right? Like you can't, they literally can't be blamed for everything. They can be blamed for like a lot of low level stuff and they're an easy target because they, they, they're they weird people. But frankly, they're weird. Everyone knows they're kind of weird. But outside of that, like you can't ignore these huge forces at work too, if, if well, that yeah. makes any sense. Well, yeah. And, 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 you know, that's the other thing is it's like, is it's like, it's confusing of priorities, right? It's a confusing of priorities. That's 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 one of the other things that the I've talked a lot about. You know, I have another article called uh, "A Coming of Age of Shedding a Skin," in which I basically say that the dissident right, at least as a movement called the dissident right, not the personnel within it, but the movement itself, has kind of reached its end point, and there's like nothing left to be done with it. Um, so now we're kind of just moving on to the next thing. And you know, one of the biggest problems is that they confuse priorities. Is it's like, all right, you know, I don't like Catholics. I don't I don't think the Catholic Church is something that um, uh, I generally like just on principle. But, you know, that doesn't mean I've got a ton of fucking friends who are like entirely in a Catholic group chat on Twitter who's like, you know, oh, yeah, Paul's saying the real shit. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say no to help. I'm not going to say no. But it's like it's a confu. Every so often we have like a religious infighting that gets started here and there. And we're, I don't mean to go too, too far off track. I want to kind of get back to this. But it's like. Y'all are confusing priorities. What is the priority? Hey, guys, there's this massive fucking force that wants to, like, genocide all of us off the face of the planet. Um, Maybe we should focus on that. And they're like, no, we're going to we're too busy fighting the 30 years war again. Uh, no, we're too, <laughs> we're too, yeah, we're too busy having a 150 year old argument about whether Jefferson or Hamilton was right. And when in reality, no one gives a shit. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know how conspiracy minded you anyone here wants to be. But if you do believe in psyops, I'm like, there will be no greater psyop than that than just to get people who are 90 percent in agreement on most things to just spend all their time fighting each other. Oh yeah. And, and it's, it's, I, I, I don't know, man. It's just, it's, it's a stupid, stupid point. And this is why I try to, a lot of people, I try to go out and meet everyone in real life. That's kind of one of the other things I'm known for is I go out and I organize events. I had a massive tour of the, of the Gettysburg battlefield, which like 20 people showed up to. Um, and I try to host these real life events with all these people within our spheres. And I try to, and you know, to, to attach faces to names. Um, and, and that's kind of the way we should keep going is it's like, well, look, like we can't be afraid of knowing each other anymore. We've got to trust each other. We got to take the risk of trusting each other because without it, we stay where we are or we slide backwards. Yeah. And, and And I've, I've talked about that before and not to get too off topic, but I like reiterating this, um, because in short, I believe that in the next 10 to 15 years, that is going to be essential. And that's going to be the only thing that we will have to assure us that we're speaking to real people. And just in short, um, we discussed this on the show before, but there's this concept. It's kind of hypothetical, but I, I can see it occurring in real life. It's called heaven banning, which is that people online, instead of being banned and feeling persecuted, uh, the platforms will slowly usher these problem users into fake areas of the platform where they're always getting engagement and likes and stuff, but it's just bots. So you will be living, you know, if you are kind of a dissident voice, they will figure out ways to corral you into a place where you feel like you're being heard just to keep you busy. Um, And I could see that happening. So the point being that I can envision a future where meeting people face to face will be the only way to assure that you're actually speaking with real people. Oh, and we have, we have a couple projects about that working. I can tell you that off, off, uh, off 
Mike. But yeah, just I, I'm with you on that. And I don't like people who always say, like, never meet anyone in real life. You know what I mean? That just, I'm like that. I would like a situation where people feel more empowered to have actual real life relationships. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, kind of bringing this back, this is how these people operate. This is how the families kind of operate. Like they all know each other. They all go to the same schools. They all marry their kids off to each other. They all, you know, keep track of their bloodlines of, of, of what they do. And, you know, I, I don't I don't want to get too schizophrenic with this, but it's like it's like. But you should. Know, we we are know. a schizophrenic <laughs> friendly space. OK, fuck it. Whatever. Right. These are people who have been practicing witchcraft, uh, dark magic, sort of stuff like that. You know, Ooh, Paul, that's not real. Yes, it fucking is. There's magic everywhere. You just don't think it and don't call it magic. Um, it's um, and, and so the thing is that they do it is just whether or not people believe it's real or has an impact. But people hear stories about these odd clubs and strange fraternities with these rituals and stuff. And we just think it's silly. But. Well, they at least believe it's relevant somehow, right? That seems unarguable. Yeah, and it's like, and it's like, the, the, the thing is with it is that it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I've, I've lost my train of thought because I, oh, well, we I, were talking about magic for a second there. Like, you, magic, you, you yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is the problem because it's like, I'm, I'm so used to, and this is a lot of people, like, you're so used to like speaking euphemistically and trying your best to like not perturb anyone's perceptions. But I guess, I guess, I guess, fuck it. I've been given carte blanche. So I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go for the jugular. I'll yeah, go for the people throat. that get the good <laughs> stuff, you know. All right. Yeah. So um, uh, these people practice magic. They've been practicing magic for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, they all believe themselves to be part of this weird bloodline system that goes back to not only the tribes of Israel, but all the way back to Atlantis itself, wh whose historical existence has more or less been proven. Um, they have transferred their wealth and their power between every major civilization, every single major commercial power on the face of the planet. Um, I can draw you a line of continuity before America. They came to America in the 19th century because they realized England was on the way out. Before America, it was England, right? Before England, it was the Netherlands. Um, you know, the transfer from the Netherlands to England was the glorious revolution when literally Prince William of Orange, the, the sovereign of the Netherlands, was invited to take control over England. And so they transferred from the Netherlands to England. Before the Netherlands, it was the um, it was the Habsburg court. Um, it was the Habsburg court. Before the Habsburg court, it was the Republic of Venice. The Republic of Venice, if you look at how Venice had power over the Middle Ages through just loaning all of this money to all of these European monarchs and, you know, and promoting the worst kind of vices, you know, this is how this is how they had power. This is how they've all they always exercise power is they find people who they want to do something and then they give them what they want. You know, if they want if they want drugs, they get them drugs. If they want women, they, you know, make sure to arrange that. Um, as a matter of fact, that's what Jeffrey Epstein was. All Epstein was, was he was the he was the provider for the ever increasing fucked up sexual interests yeah. of the people. Within he the was community. just the middle guy. He was just the fixer. He was just the guy they call on. And nothing frustrates me more than people are like, oh, we got him. We got the bad guy. I'm like, no, he was the low hanging fruit and probably a bit too more open about being a weirdo than he should have been. That's why they got him. But if you think he's the one guy, just like fucking Harvey Weinstein, I'm like, oh yeah, you got the one degenerate in Hollywood. Good job. I guess that's over. Degeneracy in Hollywood is over, right? Okay, good. Well, and you know, <laughs> degeneracy in Hollywood is over. That's kind of what it was entirely founded on. This is why I like Walt Disney so much because Walt Disney was one of these figures. He's like, hey guys, there's a whole lot of fucking pedophile Jews in Hollywood and they're kind of taking over Hollywood guys. Um, maybe we should do something about this. And you can always, you know, Howard Hughes was a similar figure. Howard Hughes, um, same thing, bunch of fucking pedophile Jews in Hollywood. Yeah. And also um, just to add to that, ever what I've always struck by is that ever since the early days of Hollywood, there have been movies and shows about the dark side of Hollywood. Like you go back to like the early like silent films, there was like little stories right up until now, like David Lynch and Mulholland Drive and all this stuff. But like Hollywood, the entirety of Hollywood, they've been making movies about how Hollywood has a dark, shadowy side of like murder and rape. Oh, so. of course. 
Well, and and this is this is just what happens whenever you introduce Jews. Is that is that like like here's the other thing. Jews are really predictable. Jews are extremely predictable. This is why they don't have control over the world because they don't have the racial competence to have control over the world. Like like we're fighting other white people who look like you or me. Like like the, the Jews, what they're good at, they're good at accounting. They're not even good at like creating fucking loans. They're not even good at that. They're good at counting money. They're also good at um, marketing to the dark side of the human mind because whenever you take a Jew, the first Jews are the most perverted people on earth. Um, you know how they market is vis-a-vis sex, right? You know, th- th- and and so that's what they do. You know, that's their function, and it works. They make money off of it because you know guilty pleasures and all that. But this is how these people rule. You know, going back to going back to my example, you know. These people rule through corruption. These people rule through giving you all of your desires and 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 making you feel like that that you can't give up these desires. You know, like whenever and and they don't they don't attack your morals. They don't, you know, but they make you destroy your own morals through your own actions. And at some point and you never stop working for them because you understand that if you stop working for them, Oh, well, my my supply of underage kids is gonna stop. My uh... <laughs> it, it seems that because I think we actually do need to get going soon. But I do want to wrap. Uh, these are some good points that I do believe can be easily wrapped up because it seems that at the center of this uh, Faustian Luciferian bargain is the idea of the debt, and then you know being in debt to someone, and you know is, would that be correct? Yeah, and and it's. <sighs> It is. It is a debt. It is. Um, um, it is very much. It is very much. You know, them hanging a sort of Damocles over your head, right? You know, before before Venice, they were in fucking. Um, Venice. Venice was founded right at the fall of the Roman Empire, but before then, they were in. Um, uh, they were in Rome. They were in Carthage. They were all the. Way, they were in Tyre and Phoenicia all the way back until Atlantis, and Atlantis ruled through this way. And this is this is the thing with it. And, you know, this is why the coming of America is actually so important, because America for the first time is a time when Atlantis has risen above the waves. And Atlantis used to be a noble, great civilization founded by our ancestors, our fathers. America is the same way. Right. And these people, all that these people can ever do is they can come to a place and they can corrupt it and siphon off all of its resources, all of its wealth and place themselves at the seat of power. And once there's nowhere left to run anymore, there's no great nation that our, you know, our people can run to anymore. It's not going to be Russia. It's not going to be anywhere else except America. Now is the point where our back and our corner is to the wall. And these people need to be overthrown, you know, and God is literally on your side, but in, by virtue of doing it, because they have marked themselves as against him by making their deals, by making their pacts, by practicing the arts they practice, this is what the solution is. This is what we should be focusing on, at least until we can get rid of them. And also, I want to add to that about some people think that conceptualizing this sort of tracing of the bloodline and whatnot is is kind of a strange thing. But just to throw back to... um. Uh, the history of the Kings of Britain by uh, Jeffrey and Monmouth. Um, it's interesting that this used to be the norm. This way of viewing your ancestors and your bloodline through time was the norm until I would argue the modern age, because um, if you, it, within that book, it's tracing the history of uh, Britain from the fall of like Troy. So there's a, a moment in the book when Julius Caesar gazes upon in the distance, you know, Rome, because they were just invading Gaul, I think it might have been. But look, and I say, what, what's that island over there? And they're, they kind of hear the story. It's like, oh, my God, they are our kinsmen because the Romans and the first Britons, which was Brutus, they they kind of they're exiles after the fall of Troy. And they 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 stumbled across well you know if you re- believe the book they consulted with uh, a spirit of diana who directed them to britain and they set up shop there but this idea of over the course of a thousand years saying oh my god we are descendants of the great city of troy so we're basically the same type of people like it wasn't uncommon for great men and great families to see themselves as family after a thousand fucking years so just to let people know this was kind of a 
a common thing. And all you would need to do was have groups of people who just keep doing that and never stopped. Exactly. Exactly. And this is, and this is the whole thing is it's like men make an unmake history at will, right? You know, history, history is not the sacred cow uh, that cannot be touched and cannot be played with and cannot be changed. And if, and the past, you know, 50 years, 75 years, that's what history has been. It's been a stultified museum culture that no one can touch, that no one can interact with, that no one can use for anything. And what I think the the thing that is about today and about our movements that is the most important is that all of a sudden history is now on the table again. We can take it, we can play with it, we can remake it, and we can use it to justify our actions because we're going to need everything that we can fucking get in the battle that's going to come. Yeah, and I I, th- I like this because it does not encourage people to get lost in vagaries. And you have a, a quote here from your article. I'll just read that for people. Just I think this summarizes it as well. So you say our enemies are not shadowy, vague, impersonal forces of nature without faces or names. As a matter of fact, this line of thinking is something our enemies directly seek to encourage and promote. This is because you can't visualize systems, but you can visualize people. If you can't visualize your enemy, then you do not know them. I liked that line so much that I wrote it down. <laughs> and also, let me ask you this. So before we go, you had one line there that I thought was very uh, key, which was um, this idea that there's no more space left to go. There's nowhere for these, these groups to run to. Now, what do you think about the interest in space exploration? Do you see the uh, colonization of space as playing into these families or their interests? <sighs> This is all speculation. I'm sure I, I know that some everyone I'm not anti space, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this stuff, but it does seem like it would be an obvious connection to these families. Well, space space is the only logical conclusion of the future of um, uh, of God's initial commandment, which he gave to Abraham, which is go forth and be fruitful. Space is the only means we have left in order to keep fulfilling that commandment. Right. Um before the pagans get mad at me, uh, I've recently discovered that not only were the tribes of Israel Aryan, but that Christianity is the Aryan religion. And that's a whole other thing. Um, but, um, um, but yes, they would very much like to take advantage of space. They would very much like to, 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 to control uh, how they do. It. And that's why they have killed any and all space exploration since the 1960s, where they kind of consolidated their power where the last major space explorations were done the the moon mission and all that they've controlled it they've stifled it they've tried to keep it under wraps for as long as possible because they still don't have that total control yet and i i do think that space is very much a place that we can call upon that we can use as a weapon in our favors like hey look you know space is going to be a top priority for us because what space does, once we get space and we figure out how to extract the stuff in space, all of our material wants on Earth are more or less solved for at least a, enough for at least a time being until we find new material wants to solve. And to help aid people in conceptualizing all this, what do you think their, for lack of a better word, their end game is or their desired state of the world being? Because to give you an example, some people would think that it, you know, the, the common thing on the right would be to say it would be just this one mulatto race that of a standard lowered IQ that can be corralled and made manipulated. But sorry, you can continue. I suppose, I suppose the best way I could, um, uh, I could talk about what their world idea is is. A lot of the people in the in the DR, what they talk about, it isn't necessarily wrong that that's what they want. You know, this sort of they want the golemized world of a of a race of rootless, casteless, um, uh, landless, religionless people that are simply perfect consumers um, that they can move to anything that they can make into anything, um, because that's what I'm a. That's that would be the true mastery over the world. They seek complete and total mastery over all existence. And even further than that, their mastery over existence, what they want to do is nothing less than kill God. They want to kill God and place themselves back in 
the seat of power at the head of heaven. This is why I recommend everyone read Paradise Lost by John Milton, the single greatest work in the English language. Um, because this is, this has been Lucifer's goal since he was thrown out of heaven in time immemorial. And this is what these people are working towards. So, you know, and they're not going to win, obviously not, because you can't kill God. But that is what they want, and that is why they must be opposed. All right. I think that's as good a place to end as any. Thank you, Mr. Fahrenheit, for uh, taking the time. Once again, if people want to learn more, it's Paul Fahrenheit, F-A-H-R-E-N-H-E-I-D-T dot substack dot com. Check that out if you'd like to know more about anything that we've talked about today. And I think thank you again for taking the time. This has been an excellent talk. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to come on anytime you'll uh, have me. I think you'll have to because we got some more stuff to talk about. <laughs> of course. All right. Thank you again. Do not let the rapists win. Listen and love Blood Satellite.